You may be wondering who we have behind us, and I'm going to invite Wanda to introduce us to our visiting musicians. Good morning. I'm Wanda Griffiths, Minister of Music, and we have with us the Paradise Adventist Academy Band and Choir. There is a paragraph about them in your program. If you want to read about them, they're on tour. And as these things go, tours tend to be a little bit tight. And so they are doing a concert this afternoon at 2 p.m. in downtown Seattle. So um, we are asking uh, that those of you who are staying for potluck, which we hope is everyone, there's plenty of food, but if you would let these wonderful young people kind of cut in front of you so that they can get some food before they go on to their next event, that would be wonderful. We're very blessed to have them, and uh, clearly this academy is doing a wonderful job, including uh, music education in their overall program. So thank you for being here, and glad you hope you enjoy it. And at this time, we want to give you an opportunity to turn to the person to the left and to the right and just pass the peace of God and welcome them to our worship service. This morning we have not only the Paradise Valley Academy joining us, but we are also in the middle of our annual spring lecture series. And I'd like to take this time to give you a short introduction and a welcome to our speaker, who is Dr. Darius Yankowicz, who is a professor of historical theology at Andrews University. He is Polish born, and naturalized in Australia, so we share a bond as people of the Commonwealth, yeah. And um, we, also, we also share having non-American accents. He is clearly understandable, but he does have an accent. So this is an internationally flavored speaking opportunity for all of you to hear today. Um, Darius has two daughters and one wife and uh, very happily married to that one wife. He has been at Andrews since 2008, and I had the opportunity to take some classes from him while I was there. Um, I shared three things. The first thing was, when I walked into his classroom, he looked at me and he said my name. He had never met me before. And it just kind of throws you off because you get to a stage when you're either in high school or in college where you just want to get in a class, you don't want anyone to give you any trouble, you want to get your grade and you want to leave. But he would stand at the door and he would shake everyone's hand and he knew your name before he met you. And he did this for 50 people. And of course, everyone is wondering, how, in this, how does this man know our names? And um, of course, he, I think he takes the time to study our pictures and our names before class and he would know our names and he would remember us in the hallways um, all the way through the semester and that made a real difference to know that he cared and he took the time to know each of us as individuals, not just as numbers. Um, 
I also had the opportunity to see him serving in one of the urban cities. There, there are urban areas in Andrews. There is one called Benton Harbor, and I saw him and his wife cooking for some of the uh, disenfranchised young people and serving them with a smile. And uh, the last thing I'll share about him is that he likes to play the piano. And it's interesting because you'll be walking along the Christian theology corridor and there'll be a door open and someone just playing the piano or a keyboard. He has a little MIDI keyboard he puts on his desk and he just plays. Um, and you know, yep, Darius is in the house. Um, so it's a privilege and it's an honor to have him here talking about authority and women's ordination, uh, which is a very pertinent topic in our church at the moment. So we just want to welcome him and hope that you stay this afternoon after lunch to hear his final presentation. Once again, thank you for coming to Green Lake and for worshiping with us. May the joy of God fill your heart as you um, are prepared for service and filled with joy for the week to come. his holy name. Lord, we are grateful that we can come as a community that is called out, a community that is imaged in the likeness of the creator, and we can worship and lift up our voices. We invite you to be with us, and we ask that you will continue to prepare us, to equip us, and to send us into service for the week to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The offering this morning is for ADRA, the Adventist Develop and, Re and Relief Agency, and I'm very glad to be able to do this offering call because this is an organization that I think very highly of. 
Adra, as a name, is about 30 years old, but its roots go back at least 80 years and probably farther back as an agency of the Adventist Church. It started out being only disaster relief, but in the mid-80s, the organization began to broaden its mission from disaster relief into programs leading to long-term development. Adra's work grew rapidly with major programs in a number of countries, this and others, international as part of its, its mission, emphasizing community development, food distribution, international institutional development, and ongoing disaster relief. I had a chance to look at their very interesting website uh, yesterday and found, <laughs> found a couple of things that I very much liked about that. One that I always think of when I think of where I want my charitable donations to go. And that is that they say, a goal, all resources, opportunities, and adv advantages are gifts which must be managed responsibly. I'm glad they have that as a goal. But even more so, the basis for the existence of ADRA is to follow Christ's example by being a voice for serving and partnering with those in need. And the statement that I just touches me deeply. Through humanitarian acts, we make known the just, merciful, and loving char character of God, and that to work with those in need is an expression of our love for God. Be generous. Would the deacons please stand for prayer as we bless the offering. Our God in heaven, thank you so much for the gifts you give us. Thank you that we have places that do good that we can trust that pass these gifts along. And please bless the recipients, we ask in your name. Amen.
Hey, isn't this music great? You see, there's more than just uh, violins and violas and cellos that you could pick when you get a little bit older. <laughs> if you're out there, Alex, sorry. Well, I have not one story for you today, but two, so let's get started. I was on a tropical island, and this island had everything that a tropical island should have. It was warm. It was warm during the day, and it was warm at night, too. It was warm in December, and it was warm in July. It had rain. You think Seattle's a rainy place, don't you? Well, they had 10 times as much rain on this island as we have in Seattle. So everything was green. There were rushing rivers, all kinds of birds, flowers. They even had, get this, mushrooms that glowed in the dark. Well, I thought that was pretty cool anyway. Um, and I like to explore this island when I have the chance. I was pretty busy teaching, but uh, we like to take hikes and walks around the island. And there was one part of the island that was said to be more beautiful than any other part. In fact, it was so beautiful that it had a nickname. They called it the Garden of Eden. Yeah. So, of course, my friends and I wanted to see what this was all about. There was just one little problem. That was the water supply for the main town. And because of that, they had made a rule that said, you can't go walking back there in this valley because we're worried about our water supply. Well, my friends and I talked about this and we thought, yeah, that's just not fair. You know, 10 years ago, people used to go back there all the time. We heard the stories and I heard that the people who live next to it, they get to go back there whenever they feel like just because they live next door. So we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't like, you know, go to the bathroom next to the water or throw litter or anything like that. So one day, Three friends and I walked down the road behind the school and we got to the path that leads into this area and we didn't turn on the path. We turned right after the path and went into the forest and snuck past the house where the people live that kind of guard the entrance. And when we thought we were safe and they couldn't see us, we came back out on the path and we spent a beautiful day just wandering around, taking pictures. In fact, I brought a picture with me. And this is what it looked like. We're a little bit crowded today. All right, do you see? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so, everything was fine. We spent a wonderful day, we came back, and that was that, or so we thought. The problem is, somebody saw us. Someone saw these foreigners going back in there. And that someone told someone else. And that someone told someone else. And that someone told our principal. And we got called to the office. I bet you thought it was only students that get called into the principal's office. Well, it's teachers too. And we were busted. So we had to promise never to go back there again. And uh, that was not very pleasant. Okay, second story. And you've probably heard this story before. In Alabama, about, oh, 50 years ago or so, and for a long time before that, and a lot of states around there in the American South, they had these laws. They had what they called segregation. And these laws were really mean and evil. They basically said that if you had white skin, you could pretty much do what you want. You could go where you want, you could eat where you want, you could have you know, the free roam of town. But if your skin was dark, then you had to go to special places to eat. You had to go to special bathrooms. You had to drink from special water fountains. You had to sit in a special place on the bus. And this had gone on for a long time. And some people said, you know what, this is wrong and we need to change it. And one of those people was a young lady by the name of Rosa Parks. Anyone heard of Rosa Parks? So this is in the town of Montgomery. She was riding on the bus and the rule was if the bus was full and some white passengers wanted to get on and you weren't white, you had to stand up and make room. 
And so that happened, and the bus driver said, please get up and move. And she said, you know, I think I'm not going to. And because of this, she went to jail. She ended up losing her job. But you know what? Because of her and because of a lot of other people who are very brave and who said, these laws aren't right, so I'm not going to follow them, things changed. The rest of the country looked at this and said, you know what? Those protesters are right. These laws are wrong and we need to fix them. And eventually they did. It took a long time and a lot of struggle, but eventually they got rid of segregation. So what's the common point between these two stories? Well, in both cases, someone decided to disregard authority. They decided to do something that authority said was wrong. But Rosa Parks is a hero. I'm not a hero. Why do you suppose that is? <laughs> well, I have one idea. Uh, and that idea is, if you're breaking a rule, or if you're going to disobey authority just because you want to, because it's something you want to do, like, I just wanted to go hiking where I wasn't supposed to go hiking, then probably people aren't going to be very sympathetic when you get in trouble. But if you decide to disregard authority, break a law, when you're actually sacrificing a great cost to yourself and you are making things better for other people, then maybe you're on the right track. So I hope that our speaker today will have some more to say about how we relate to authority. And this would be a good conversation to have with your parents this afternoon, who, by the way, are always right. <laughs> All right, thank you. And don't forget to collect the offering for the children in Sri Lanka.
Our gracious and loving Lord, we come to you today with grateful hearts. We thank you for all the good you shower upon us every moment. We thank you for love and friendship, for time and space to meet together to worship you. We're happy to be here, and thank you for being glad that we're here. Thank you for persons that we hold dear to us, those far and those near. Thank you for everyone present today, for our speaker, the musicians, our teachers, leaders, greeters, deaconesses and deacons, and those preparing lunch, and everyone who is making our time together and our worship together pleasant. Thank you for forgiving us when we fail. We know, we know so well that we haven't met our ideals for ourselves, much less your ideals for us this week. Please forgive us. Help us to know in our hearts and in our souls that when we sincerely ask, you do forgive us, and you can empower us to do better and to be more like you. Thank you for being our rock and our refuge in hard times. We pray for those in our congregation who have requested prayer for healing, for courage, and for calmness. We especially remember today Charles Berthoff. We also remember those who the prayer team are praying for regularly. And we have many others in our own hearts that we hold up to you today. We pray for the people of the world who are in distress from so very many kinds. Send your healing calm and comfort to everyone in need. Thank you, Lord, you giver of all good things. Help us this week to be your hands and your feet in this world and to pass on the goodness and the love that we have received from you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet, the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death.
Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Good morning. There we go. Good morning. It is a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here with you in this wonderful church. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was so nice for me to leave behind cold and rainy Michigan and arrive on Thursday in cold and rainy Seattle. (laughs) I felt home right away. But really, I had a great privilege yesterday to visit your lovely city. It's really, really beautiful. As Andreas was taking me around, I just couldn't stop thinking how much it reminds me of my home, that what I call now my home city, Sydney, Australia. All you need is a harbor bridge and opera house, and it'll be like Sydney. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So I really enjoyed visiting the fish market. I saw the fish throwing and all this kind of stuff, great stuff. I'd I like to come back here and visit more. What a beautiful place. Thank you for beautiful music. Uh, this is Paradise Adventist Academy Band. So I really appreciated your music and your playing. It's really beautiful. My own daughter is in... Uh, Uh, Andrews Academy and she plays violin and my younger daughter plays in a band so I listen to this music quite a lot and I love it especially when my girls play so thank you so much for providing us with wonderful music and thank you Mark for that interesting story Uh, it fits right into what I'm going to try to tell you today Uh, my sermon today is a little bit unusual because it's part of the lecture, lectureship series. It's supposed to be a lecture with PowerPoint and so on. So I had to reorganize a few things and uh, do it a little bit differently. And I was told that I only have half an hour, which is kind of difficult for this topic. But I'll try to do my best. Uh, the title of those uh, lectureships that I was invited to present here in this church uh, is Ordination. As you know, our church is discussing the issue of ordination right now, uh, specifically the ordination of women to gospel ministry. Uh, My area of study is not necessarily ordination of women, but the whole idea of ordination. And once we understand what ordination is all about, what it is that we are called to do as ordained members of the body of Christ, then the whole idea of women's ordination just fades in the background. So uh, today I would like to just speak to the issue that is extremely important. In fact, 
I usually like to say what I presented yesterday is just the introduction. We talked about the history of ordination and we realized that what we do in our church did not come as a revelation to us, but it's part of a tradition of Christianity. The way we do things are part of what has been done before, before us. What we found out yesterday is that the way we practice ordination in our church for, for pastor's ordination or even elder's ordination is not exactly what we find in the scripture. There is no direct correlation what, what's done in the Bible, in the New Testament, and what we do today. So the conclusion was yesterday that really, ordination is part of tradition that we do rather than part of what we find in the scripture. And today is the most important part. The most important part because all of our discussion on ordination, as we discuss it right now, I'm a member of a big committee organized by the General Conference, Theology of Ordination Study Committee. I presented at this committee and what I'm going to, what I presented yesterday, what I'll be talking today and this afternoon is part of my presentations, part of my presentations that I made to those big committees. Today is the most important topic. Really, if, if you could wrap your minds around what I'm trying to say today and try to comprehend what we do really find in the scripture, this is, this can revolutionize the lives on not only of the church, but personal lives, on a personal level, so our relationships between each other, between the husbands and wives, between parents and children, and so on. I believe that this is a recipe for great success as a church on both corporate and personal level. Let me begin with this story. Uh, once upon a time, I was a missionary to Fiji Islands. I am Polish by birth, naturalized Australian. I said yesterday that I speak English because I'm Australian. I have an accent because I'm Polish. Uh, I was too old to leave Poland to lose my accent, so I keep it. I love it, actually. My wife loves it, so that's all that matters. But uh, at one stage, after I completed my studies at Andrews, went back to Australia, we were called to serve as missionaries in Fiji. And uh, I remember one time a group of young people visiting our home. And this particular young man was very interested. Uh, he was about to be married, a few months from being married. And he really, he observed us, our family, and he, he, he had a pertinent question on his mind. He really needed to know something. So finally he cornered me when I was alone in my uh, side of the house without my wife and he asked me a question. Who is the boss in this house? I said, okay, nobody asked me a question like this before. I said, what do you mean? Well, who makes all the decisions in this house? And I said, well, I never thought about it. We just made those decisions together, my wife and I. Yes, but somebody has to have a final say in your house. I said, well, I don't know what to say. You know, I mean, we've never had a situation that I had to override my wife. My wife had to override me or so on. We've just never been in a situation like this. He couldn't believe it. I said to him, well, talk to my wife. Okay. So my wife comes in a few moments later and he asks the same question. My wife looks at him and says, I don't know, it's not our problem. He just couldn't believe it, okay? That in our family, things are different. There's no, no, no some, not at somebody who has the final say when there is a conflict. Somehow we're able to arrive at, uh, at decisions together. Well, another situation. While we were at the same place in Fiji, we were living in Suva. Uh, we didn't have many friends who looked like us, in a way. So we kind of were drawn to a group of evangelical Christians, and my wife struck a friendship with a group of women. And those women were gathering together once a week, to helping each other with children and talking about theological issues. All of them were missionaries of uh, denominations like Baptists. Uh, I think they were mainly Baptists. Okay, so she spent time with them, and this is the first time in her life that she in encountered this idea of headship, male headship. Those women were constantly talking about how to be a better helpmeet, how to be 
a better, how to function better under the headship of their husbands. And for my wife, it was kind of a very weird experience because this was never part of Adventist talk in her lifetime. She's a born Adventist, and we, we never talked about those kind of issues as far as male headship, who is the boss, how, how a woman can function as a helpmeet, and so on. And it was a big issue for those women. Some of them were very strong. And kind of to submit to their husbands, it was very difficult. They, they tried to do it to the best of their abilities, and they struggled with this. And the husband of one of those ladies was a Baptist pastor who became my friend. And I remember something that he told me once about his daughters, his teenage daughters, and he said this. At, time is, uh, at this moment, I still have authority over my daughters. And a time is coming when I will pass my authority to the authority of their husbands. Their husbands will have, have, have authority over my daughters. And once again, I was kind of struck by this different kind of thinking that happens in variety of evangelical congregations that is so different to what we are as Adventists. And yet, I realize that very often we do struggle with the same issues in a different way. Well, if I had a slide, I mean, the screen here, if I could project it on a slide, which I can't, so I have to, have to use your imagination, I'll put a big word in red letters and, and that says authority. Just imagine, authority, okay? And, and by the way, I'm a teacher, all right? I'm not a regular preacher, I'm a teacher, so I will be asking you questions. So please feel free to shout your answers and I will, I'll take your answers, okay? So imagine this big, letters, red letters shouting the words authority. What instantly comes to mind? What kind of emotions a, a word like this would evoke? Fear. Fear, okay, what else? Power, okay? Okay, well, what else? Pardon? Okay, privilege could be, okay. There are some, there are, generally speaking, we could say that there are some good associations with authority, but generally speaking, we don't like authority. Tell me one thing. When was the last time when you really felt, when, when you were driving down the highway and you saw just behind your car red and blue blinking lights and you are saying, yes, finally they got me. Is this how you feel? No, okay, you feel like, oh no, they caught me off. <laughs> okay, we, we don't like this. Uh, well, I, I can ask any young person here, when you are asking, mom, dad, can I go to a party this Thursday night? And your mom and dad say, no, I don't think it's a good idea. You say, okay, thank you for telling me I can't go to the party, right? <laughs> is, this, is this how we react? Okay, for the most part, we are some kind of, in some way, wired for dislike of authority. Okay, authority is an essential part of, of our human experience, and authority is good, okay? There's a, there are lots of good aspects to authority. But in our general experience, we do not like authority. Authority is kind of associated with, with this forcing somebody to do something that I don't want to do. Isn't it true? Okay, forcing somebody that I have to do that I don't necessarily want to do because I want to do what I want to do. And this is across the board. Okay, and very often authority is abused. What is the, okay, when you are stopped on the, by, by policemen with the blinking lights, all right, what is the most common sense response? Are you going to say to yourself, I'm going to disobey. I'm going to keep driving. Is this what you're going to do? Okay, what are you going to do? You are going to pull over. In other words, you are going to submit to authority. Now, when I use the word submit, what comes to mind? Can you give me some word associations with the word submit? You like the word? Do you like to submit? Okay, does anybody here likes to submit? I like to submit all the time to everything that somebody tells me I like to say. Is this anybody here? I don't think so, okay? Once again, we are wired in such a way that we do not like to submit, okay? We just, 
repulsed by submission almost to some, to some extent because submission has these wrong connotations. Okay, in a dictionary I found this definition, the action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Or example, they were forced into submission. Who likes to be forced into submission? Okay? I don't think anybody does. So when someone says, women shall have no authority over men, tell me what comes to mind. Instantly. Women shall have no authority over men, okay? When we read those words, those passages in the, in, in the first Timothy, instantly we see this image of you have a woman above men and she's going to rule over men, tell men what to do and so on, and he will have to submit. Who likes that? Nobody likes that, okay? And this is what we need to rethink. We need to rethink the very word authority. Okay, uh, so let me present some of my ideas here for your consideration. I do not claim to have all the answers. So what I'm going to give you are just my observations that come from the years of study of the scriptures. Take them for what they are worth and make your own decision on this. But before we go any further and discuss this issue of authority, I think we need to agree on certain basic truths before we can even continue. So first of all, let me ask you a question, and if you can tell me yes or no to this question, okay? It would be easy if I had a projector, but this church does not. Uh, I kind of admire you that you do not have a screen here. It looks better, but it would be kind of better for presentation like this, but that's okay. Okay, the New Testament knows only one head of the church, Jesus Christ. True or false? True? The New Testament knows only one head, Jesus Christ. True? I think we all can agree on this. All right, I don't, this, didn't see anybody dissenting here. He never left the church and told us there are other heads in the church, okay? So he's the only head. Now, the second thing. Jesus' words matter to the church. True or false? Okay, he's the head of the church. His words do matter to the church. I think we can agree on this. Third point. Any meaningful discussion on the issue of authority has to take into consideration what Jesus had to say about authority. True or false? True. I think very much it is true. So when we use the word authority, we can have two associations. Number one association is what we experience every day, the dislike of authority, the dislike of what's happening around us, and dislike of submission. On the other hand, we can think about what Jesus had to say about authority. And to, to tell to tell you what Jesus had to say about authority, I would like to tell you, uh, to ask you to open the Gospel of Mark with me today. If you have your Bibles, please open the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to tell you a story that was present, that's presented in all three synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? They say the same story with a little bit of a different variation, but this story is absolutely crucial to what we are going to talk about. Okay? Mark chapter 10. And I would like to take you to verse 35. Okay, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. I'm reading from a New International Version today. All right, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. All right, here we go. Then James, you know this story, but let me just read it and come, make some comments on this. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him, and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus kind of probably look at them kind of with this question marks in his eyes and he says what do you want me to do for you and they said let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory i have a question for you what do they want what are they asking for power what else okay privilege what else Authority ruling over, okay, being over somebody. This is actually what they're asking. Well, I can just imagine at this point Jesus being completely frustrated. I mean, they've walked with him for a while. He's been teaching them, and they're asking a question like this. So he, he just says, you don't know what you're asking for. You have no idea. Can you drink the cup? I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. We can. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea here. 
They did, but they don't know what they're talking. Jesus said to them, you will drink, okay? Verse 40, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they had been prepared. And now verse 41, I find it fascinating. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Okay, stop here. Why do they become indignant with James and John? Because of what? They want the same. What do they want? They want to reign in the kingdom of God. They want to have all the people under them. They want to be the police car behind all the faithful in heaven. Okay? They want to be just over the people. They, they think in terms of hierarchy. People set above somebody else. And Jesus is going to teach them a lesson. A very important lesson that disciples had a very difficult time to learn because of the society that they grew up with. The society, the presupposition that they had in their minds, okay? But what Jesus is said exasperated Jesus in verse 42 is saying this. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and the high officials exercise authority over them. Verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what you see in this short passage that's so significant that, that, that we still don't comprehend this very well. You see a popular view of ministry, of authority, which is lording over somebody, being over, set over somebody, like in governmental structure, and you have something different, something that disciples cannot comprehend, the authority of the Christian leader. So on one hand, you've got domination, final decision making that requires submission. On the other hand, you've got something weird, something absolutely strange, something that is, that is completely misunderstood by the disciples and they can only understand, they only understand this after, during the Pentecost. Up until that time, they have no idea what Jesus is talking. So what Jesus is trying to say to them, within that passage, there are two very significant words extremely significant words. In Greek, they sound like this, diakonos and doulos. Diakonos, you should know, it's modern translation, it's servant, deacon. Doulos means slave. So what is Jesus doing here? He's saying, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the people outside and they kind of lord it over each other. They stand over one another. They exercise authority. Not so with you. I don't want you to do that because in my kingdom, everybody is a slave. In my kingdom, there's no ruling one over above another. In my kingdom, you are servants and slaves. And the greatest example is what I've done. I was a king of the universe, here I am, slaving and being a servant for you. Okay, what about those two words, diakonos and doulos? Outside of the New Testament, uh, they are generally used in the same way. Today, we've lost the meaning of those words. They are translated mainly as uh, servant, minister, uh, diakon, or something like this. But when you look into ancient history, you'll find out that those were two most potent, most powerful metaphors for being nobody. That's basically what it is, for being nobody. Okay? Instead of being somebody, you're being nobody. All right? Diakonos and doulos. Uh, this is basically uh, servant and slave. Who were the slaves? There were people who, who did what they were told. They didn't do things according to their own will. They did what they were told. They were entirely at the disposal of others. In the Theological Dictionary of New Testament, I found this statement on diakonos. Ruling, not serving, is the proper activity of men. Serving belongs to women and slaves. In those times, children, slaves, servants, women had zero authority in the church. They were not even persons. 
Okay, so when Jesus is using those words, diakonos and doulos, he describes his own mission to the world. He describes who he is, how he functions with others, and he tells his disciples, unless you reorganize your thinking, unless you take those foreign ideas of hierarchy, pecking order, being one above the other, out of your minds, you're not going to be in true kingdom of God. This is not going to be kingdom of God because it will resemble what's happening outside. You have to create something completely different. And it's not about having authority over somebody. It's not about having power over somebody. It's about slaving for somebody. About being slave. About being a servant. So, whatever diaconia and douleia, which is slavery, means it's no authority, not authority as we understand today. It's something completely different. So when people say, women should not have authoritative positions in the church, what do they mean? Does it mean that they cannot slave? I think that many women already do. Okay, that they cannot serve? That's what ministry is all about. It's not about being above somebody, it's about being below somebody. That's, that's what it is all about. So, coming back to this text, okay, uh, of Mark 10, 35. Uh, Jesus makes a clear cut, okay, I've got an illustration here that will help us to visualize, okay, I've got a big knife. Uh, Hedelda today was afraid that she's going to get cut next, sitting next to me with this big knife. I have a, a cucumber that will represent something for us today, okay? Imagine that this cucumber has written the word authority right in front here. And Jesus comes, and with his words, he takes a big knife, as big knife as he can, and he takes a clean cut. And now, you don't have one word for authority, but you have two words for authority. One word is representing the rotten kind of authority that is present in the world. A rotten kind of authority that stinks, that is hierarchical, that uh, is kind of ordering people what to do and has final decision making. And you have a kind of authority that Jesus is talking about. Something completely different. And now imagine this. For however many decades we have been talking about women's ordination and discussing the issue of authority in the church. I have a question for you. Which authority we're talking about? Okay, it should be clear that we have been talking about the rotten kind of authority. Hierarchical kind of authority. Authority that orders other people to say and what to do and, and uh, I, I think if, if I would want, I believe women should be in ministry, but if women go to ministry and exercise this kind of authority, we have a problem. We have a problem if men exercise this kind of authority. We have a problem if fathers, husbands, or wives sometimes exercise this kind of authority. Jesus says, not so with you. Can you say it with me? Not so with you. That's his message. He calls each one of us to reject this kind of authority and embrace his vision of authority, healthy kind of authority, authority that is meaningful, it is different, something that disciples could not understand at all. But they are, oh, and by the way, it is Jesus' words alone that should define the use of authority as we find it in the scripture. Okay, not our ideas, Jesus' words alone. But there are other words for authority in the Gospels. One of them is exousia. Exousia is authority. This is the authority that Jesus had, okay? The Bible tells us Jesus had authority. What kind of authority he had? He had authority to heal, authority to bring life to people. This is the authority that we all have as Christians. Authority to, to bring healing through the words of the gospel into the lives of people. Okay, this, another word for authority is dynamis, from which we have the word dynamite. 
today, dynamis, Greek word dynamis, okay? Jesus had this kind of authority. What kind of authority is this? This is the authority of Jesus when he is exercising the demons, when he's healing people, okay? When he's telling, go away from this person. This is the dynamis, dynamis kind of authority. None of those, okay, there's exousia authority, life words, teaching, and, and the, the, uh, the power of healing signifies some kind of a lording over anybody in any form of shape. So Jesus' understanding of authority goes beyond those ideas of hierarchy, of pecking order, of anything like this. Thus to the question, who is the greatest? What is Jesus' reply? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? What is he saying to the people? The least of you is the greatest. For he who is among, uh, the least among you is the greatest. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant, diakonos once again, of all. And then he compares his group of followers to the rotten kind of idea of authority and he tells, what does he tell them? Not so with you. Can you say it again with me? Not so with you. Not so with you. But there's one more. One more kind of authority. We call it absolute exousia. Absolute authority. Do you know where it occurs in the New Testament? Matthew 28, 20, 28. All authority, all exousia in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, this is a kind of different authority altogether. This is the authority of the creator. This is the authority of the almighty, omniscient, omnipresent God. And how does this omniscient, omnipresent Christ, how does he exercise his authority in the church? What does he do? Does he force us to be obedient? Does he take away our free choice? He could, but he doesn't. So how does he exercise it? I found the answer in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. And verse 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Jesus loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice for God. So how does Jesus exercise his authority? This is how he do it. Absolute authority of Jesus that is given to him is a supreme example of love, servanthood, and self-sacrifice. And in virtue of this authority, he commissions the apostles to make disciples of all men, of all people, and teach them what the kingdom of God is all about. This is not that kind, this is a completely different kind of authority than this. It's a brand new kind of authority. And how do we humans tend to behave? What do we do? Many of us exhibit tendency that want to be in control of others. We like to have authority over actions of others, be in control. In our circles, we sometimes call it spiritual authority, and thus we baptize an unchristian concept. And we are worshiping God who gave himself up for us. Go figure. So, my friends, I can tell you only one thing on the basis of what I've seen in the New Testament. I can tell you only one thing. A laying on of hands, or something that we call ordination in our church today, is ordination to slavery, not to having authority over. When you are ordained, you're going down, not up, just as Jesus did, just as God himself did, on your knees to be slaves. And you know, disciples did not understand this. They did not understand it when Jesus invited them to come to the upper room. You know, the upper room experience is a fascinating uh, fascinating looking to the mindset of, of those disciples. They come into the upper room and what do they see? They see everything is prepared. Jesus is there. They're sitting down together and there's one thing missing. There's one object in the room that makes them all highly uncomfortable. What is it? 
It's a basin. It's a basin. Why is it making them uncomfortable? When they see this basin, a discussion breaks out among them. Who is the greatest? This is the day before Jesus is going to die. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Why are they discussing this? They're discussing this because none of them want to wash the feet of another. Because this was a function of a slave. It was a function of a, of a servant. Okay, So nobody wants to do that. And then Jesus gives them once again an example what it means to be slave. What it means to lead leadership by being a slave. And he goes beyond that. The very next day, he dies for those whom he loves. Ultimate act of Christ's submission to humanity. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Christ submitted to you. Jesus submitted his authority, gave away his authority for you. He submitted himself so much that he went to the cross and died for you. An ultimate act of submission. And how do we tend to behave? How come after that great grand act of history, we are still asking ourselves the question, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest in the church? Who can have all the positions of authority? Who can be the pastor? Why do we do that? Disciples understood, and they created a church that was different than any other organization because they remembered what Jesus told them. They remembered, he said to them, not so with you. Not so with you. I would like to, in conclusion, just read to you a couple of pages from the paper that I wrote on this very topic where what I've taught you today is the summary of that paper that I have here. I presented it at the Theology of Ordination Study Committee. And uh, I'll just read it to you. Okay, and this, then we conclude. I began this paper with a discussion on the nature of authority. Our God, who is a God of order, created a world in which human beings, the crown of his creation, were to live according to the authoritative patterns that governed the universe prior to the creation of the earth, then seen entered the world. The way God exercised his authority was challenged and a counterfeit notion of authority was introduced. This is the notion of authority that the prince of this world taught the first couple. This is the notion of authority that forever darkened the human vision of God and his character. The precise reason why Christ, God incarnate, came to this earth and founded a community like no other was to counteract the counterfeit notion of God's authority. He accomplished it by his life of divine slavery that ultimately led him to the cross. Unfortunately, human beings, weakened by millennia of sin's existence on this earth, returned to the old patterns of thinking soon after the death of its pioneers. Notwithstanding our devotion to scripture, we, Seventh-day Adventists, inherited these patterns of thinking that, that, that are so tenaciously and tragically ingrained in the Christian faith. It is a common experience human experience, to be attracted to those who exhibit genuine Christian authority, and to be repelled by the attitude of those who rely solely on authority of their office. Ideally, genuine Christian authority and the authority of a representative function should be integrated. After all, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with people holding an office, even though it's not really a biblical concept. Neither is there anything inherently wrong with our church the way our church is currently organized. However, while Jesus left us with no model of running the church, he was adamant that his church would not resemble secular structures where authority was organized according to a pecking order. Is it possible that our current discussions regarding women's ordination are complicated by our misunderstanding or misuse of true Christian authority? I am a third generation Adventist. I'm a grandson of a head elder, son of a pastor administrator, and an ordained pastor myself. 
In my, all my years as a Seventh-day Adventist, rarely have I encountered the integration of true, genuine Christian authority with the authority of an ordained pastor. Sadly, I often struggle with such integration myself. Some of the most authoritative persons in my life were not ordained ministers. The one I placed above all others was an old Christian gentleman in Tasmania, where, I, where for a time I served as a pastor after receiving my doctorate, who had only four classes of formal education and had only been ordained as a deacon. I recognized, accepted, and submitted to the crew true Christian authority he represented, and learned more from him about slaving for Christ and others than from a lifetime of being an Adventist and all my theological education combined. Unfortunately, too many of us, too many of us being an ordained pastor tends to be about having authority over others, status, ranking, male headship, rather than being slaves for Christ and others. This, I believe, is the real reason why we are spending our time discussing the issue of ordination and who can be ordained. Now, I understand that slavery has few positive connotations. It implies no honor, no glory, no status, no ranking. Nobody likes the fact, no, nobody likes that. In fact, I'm repulsed by the very concept of slavery. And yet, this is the word that Jesus used to describe himself and his work. This is the word that the apostles used to describe themselves and they work as well and that of their co-workers, both men and women. This is what Jesus is calling us, Adventist pastors, deacons, elders, presidents, conference unions, regular church members, everybody, not to have authority over people, but rather over the task of fulfilling the great commission of Christ. Gospel order in the church does not require hierarchical leadership, spiritual or otherwise. For true Christian ministry is not about status, rank, gender, equality, rights, or having spiritual authority over others. It is about being slaves of Christ and his people. Not to rule over others, but be examples, and through the witness of our lives, to woo others to follow Christ. No human laying on of hands can provide this kind of authority. Only the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart can. While all Christians are to be ministers, those who are set apart for special ministry, both men and women, are called to be chief examples of slavery to Christ and others. I'm convinced that when we embrace this understanding of authority and ministry, Christ's vision for his community will be fulfilled. Revival and reformation will follow and the problem of women's ordination will disappear. So I want to leave this short investigation of the nature of Christian authority with a question. Are we going to follow culture, both secular and religious, which has taught us hierarchical and elitist understanding of authority, or are we are going to follow Christ, who said, not so with you? May God bless you. Thank you.
going to crown you with many crowns. And as we are crowning you, we remember what you did for us, how you submitted yourself to us and became sin for us and died for us on the cross. Lord Jesus, how is it that we still haven't learned that lesson? How is it, Lord? I know, Lord, that in our hearts we all want to be like you. We all want to follow you wherever you will lead us. Thank you, Jesus, for the great example. We want to be like you. May the God of peace, the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great slave of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
We want to thank the Academy for being here today. They have had to cut their program short uh, so that they can get on to their next concert. So that is the conclusion of the postlude recital. So if you would like to show your appreciation, now would be the time. <laughs> <laughs>